So briefly, what brought you to Squist? Um, actually, I got invited by Christine. Uh, we connected through Twitter, and it's, it happens sometimes that you always get surrounded by people that are actively working towards changing the mindsets of people, especially uh, trying to encourage uh, women in science. So uh, Christine invited me to give a talk uh, in one of the series of the brown bags, and that's how I connected. That's how I started knowing. Uh, it was through Christine. And how does it feel to go to a Squist meeting? I mean, it's fascinating because I, before, even though I'm here for a long time in Canada, I'm going through, I uh, would say, um, a lot of like personal problems in, as a woman, as a minority in STEM, I never had the support and I never knew about those. And now I see that this, uh, I can see many women going through the same journey as I did, but also there's a personal connection, personal stories, you're not alone. And most important thing, there's always somebody that is willing to help you and understand you. It sounds like you're very, very busy, but what was your role within Squist or what has it been? So I think in most of, because it's a personal passion and because I went through so many things myself, I just don't want uh, people, new immigrants, new women to go through the same journey. So I want to eliminate these barriers. So one of the ways that I help is like amplifying the messages and all the initiatives that Swiss uh, brings. And uh, I invite other people to join. I uh, highlight them. And I always like amplifying and saying how Swiss is here to help women. So like Christine recruited you, you're recruiting others. Other ones, yes, absolutely. And tell me a bit about yourself very briefly. What's your background and um, how did you come to where you are now? Was it just a direct line? You decided at high school age, this is what I'm doing, where I'm doing it, and it just worked out? Actually, I was... Uh, so. And right now I am a mucosal immunologist uh, with background in just diseases. Actually, my first uh, idea to enter into science is because I wanted to be a paleontologist. But then when I uh, had, a, uh, during undergrad, I went to do an internship at one uh, university in, in Peru and I trained with Dr. Robert Gilman from Hopkins. And uh, at this point in 1991, we had one of the worst uh, cholera epidemics in Peru. And when I saw people, especially kids, dying and having diseases, that changed me a lot. And that's when I start focusing in initiatives that will save lives. And I become, uh, then I got a master's in and molecular biology, but uh, molecular epidemiology of facial diseases, and eventually I had a PhD in uh, microbiology and immunology. That's the same as my husband. He's an immunologist, microbiologist. Oh. Um, so what's your message for Squist on its 40th anniversary and what's your hopes for its future? I wish uh, Swiss as a, it's a fantastic, um, uh, we'll say group of women, at, and uh, it's, it's doing a fantastic job, obviously, 40 years across the country. But I wish I, wish I could see uh, Swiss more expanded nationally. I wish we could actually have more, a, we'll say, representation in terms of uh, women from different uh, backgrounds, immigrant women. And also, it would be really good to start inviting men to see, because we women didn't create the problem. And so we need a lot. And I think it would be nice to have a group of men to understand how and to see how valuable are those groups of men. So we need allies. So I will, I will see Swiss uh, expand to nationally more immigrants and perhaps more allies. So did you run into any problems because you are a woman in STEM when you were starting, when you were working on 
your all your way through your career, have you encountered any issues because you were a woman and because you were an immigrant? Absolutely, absolutely. And a lot, perhaps it's not intentionally, a lot may might be implicit bias, but just as I said uh, the other day, even my name, even my name, because uh, my name is a Latin name, it's, and it really, uh, just like there is a break. When I apply to a job, if I have a name that is Latin, they think that maybe my education wasn't here. And in fact, my education was here. But just my name itself doesn't, doesn't allow me to, for instance, apply to big jobs. And uh, also uh, other implicit bias are, uh, how's my accent? My accent not necessarily is Canadian. I didn't master, I'm here 25 years. I didn't master this. Canadian accent, but that doesn't mean that I'm not in, I'm not capable of doing my job. I'm capable. I might not have that accent, the Canadian accent, but I am. I am. My uh, um, accreditation is as another Canadian here. So yes, and through my uh, journey from undergrad all the way here, I every single time I had a lot of problems, a lot of like. Uh, uh, difficulties and yeah I can I, it will take a long <laughs> meeting to tell you all the things that I I face here. One of the things that I hear women bring to the table is compassion because we've been raised to be caregivers and one of the ways I see your compassion coming out is your work as a scientist as a woman as a human being on long, long COVID both as a researcher and as um, a person familiar with COVID and too many times I see the research is like the blind man and the elephant. The psychiatrist said, well, let's try this psychoactive drug that might help. And the liver specialist says, well, let's try this drug. And what we need is the person who can see the whole elephant which is for long COVID an immunologist. So tell me briefly how you feel about your work with long COVID. Yeah, you raised a good point there, Lorraine, uh, compassion. And so many people perhaps would like to have this empathy, but they didn't go through their journey of being a patient themselves. So I, uh, unfortunately, I almost lost my daughter against an autoimmune disease. And it was a horrible journey and having my daughter kind of like having seizures and like stop breathing in my arms at this point, bring all this mater, mat, uh, maternal instinct in me trying to save her. Since then, also that changed my my completely my my life, changed myself, and now I wanna really. Uh, I don't want that experience for another mother. I don't want that experience for another human being. So that empathy, that compassion sometimes comes, unfortunately, from people that suffer, that goes through a, a horrible journey and you don't wanna have other human beings there. So that's what my job as in COVID-19 resources is because there are preventable diseases. Sometimes you, ha you don't have that choice, but if you have the preventable way to get COVID and to get long COVID, you do everything because you don't want another human being suffering. So yes, I am doing this a national campaign. It's, a, it's to honor these patients, to tell the world exist. This is happening. This is a serious. There are two, over 200 symptoms uh, reported for long COVID. And sometimes the, those are invisible or invisible diseases, but doesn't mean that we should not acknowledge them. So yes, I, I am doing a lot of work, but it was through my experience of being a caregiver and having uh, my daughter going through a journey. Luckily, she's fine. She's good. She's doing very well. And she's also a volunteer of Swiss. She's very passionate about it. Yeah. It sounds like your compassion born of experience has led to very positive action using all your knowledge. So what's your hope for the world for the future? If I said, okay, you can custom design the future 
how would the future be different? What would you include um, in the world? How would you change people briefly? Briefly, I think through education. And uh, I believe that everybody should uh, get education and education should be free. I think people have a lot of capacity and intelligence, but many people lack the support, the, the systems. So I advocate for uh, free education. I myself travel to get um, to go to, we'll say, Africa or countries that they don't have the resources. So I, I teach. And so I try to, even through my platforms, always try to teach and give education. And that's where I am. Uh, education, compassion, health, things that actually human beings are good at, but we somehow lose track of them. We focus on something totally different. So uh, yeah, um, um, being more, um, I feel myself, I sometimes I call myself a humanist, try to get these core values of being a, a human being and, and really pass it to other ones. Yeah. And lastly, um, you were nominated, you were one of the finalists for the YWCA Women of Distinction Awards. Can you tell me the category and how it felt to be recognized? You were in some pretty august company. I was. This is, um, I honestly never, never expected to be there and, uh, against uh, this wonderful uh, women, fantastic company. I no, I. It was a surprise. Uh, it was. It's beautiful, I guess, to be recognized because I do this for myself because I love helping people. But when there's people that are actually recognizing your work, it's another. Uh, I guess people are paying attention. So that also means that it's a commitment to continue doing that. And yeah, it was. It was fabulous. It was great. It was a fantastic celebration for other for many women here in in metro vancouver and uh, yeah it's fascinating and encouraging and yeah it's it's good it's good for the younger generations so my category was in health and and wellness thank you janet oh, you're welcome thank you so much lorraine